Awesome. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining me today. I'm in a two-part series of Getting Off Your Ask. For those that will be watching the replay or on YouTube later, uh, my name is Shanquetta Cunningham, the CEO and founder of Cares Group Consulting, where the mission is to support mission-based leaders in their um, efforts to increase their income, impact, and influence. And by that, I just have adopted the um, mindset and put it into practice that we have to disrupt narratives that nonprofits um, cannot be profitable. In fact, they must be profitable. Profit is not a dirty word. Uh, profit is being able to access the more. And don't we all need more? And so with that, um, I am excited to begin teaching. I am extremely excited for one, because one of the beautiful things about nonprofit organizations is that everyone has a story. Everyone has a story. Um, we are all uh, in this position to where it's the how we share our story. And I also believe that we are all one ask away, hence the term getting off our ask. And if you have been in presentations with me, you know that that is trademark pending as well. Um, but getting off our ask with the K and the pun intended, is that it comes from the biblical principle that we have not because we ask not. It's also from the principle that even in our ask, we can also ask amiss. We can ask wrong. Um, even in our efforts to support our communities and being established as nonprofit entities, or you are on your way to establishing a nonprofit, People do not have to do anything for you. Um, you want to invite people to experience what it is to make an impact by going on this journey with you while you are doing the work that can support you in that. And so we have to get off our ask. So let me start with something. $24,000. $24,000. $24,000. That is the median income for Black women businesses in the state of Arkansas. That while Black women businesses are using the term business and entrepreneurship, the reality is these businesses are on the LMI index, low to moderate income businesses. When women are leading and are the head of households in the state, how can women grow and excel financially and socially when businesses are having a tough time to survive. It's like the old saying that says, when America gets a cold, African-Americans gets the flu. And so how do we change the trajectory of supporting all businesses to thrive in our state? We have to increase access. Because it's not race, it's not wealth, it's not culture that divides our community, it's the access to information. And so Over a Cup was designed to disrupt the narratives that we have to look at things from the surface. You give us the access, we'll do the rest. That is our story. That Over a Cup is designed to support Black women entrepreneurs in the state of Arkansas. So as a nonprofit founder as well, I know the impact of what it takes to share your story, to evoke an emotion. And we are going to dive deeper into that. Your nonprofit organization has a story. Your mission has impact worth sharing. What do you believe right now that is the greatest asset of your organization? What's your story? And I literally want to take the next 60 seconds for you to reflect on that. What makes our organization unique? Because you have to believe that you have something in this market space of philanthropy that is unlike any other. Now, we know that there is nothing new under the sun, but everyone has their own 
thumbprint and how they do the work. Let's just think about the examples of Chick-fil-A and Popeyes, right? Those are two places that specializes in chicken, but each of them have their own uniqueness in their products and in their service delivery. So I ask you, and I need you to write it down, because a part of knowing your story and getting your story to be profitable for you is to believe that you are unique in what you do. There's a fake piousness that we have when it comes to nonprofit entities. It's a fake, it's a fake humility. We want to go, go into rooms and walk into spaces as like we're just like everyone else trying to make a difference. No, you are not. I am not like everyone else. I say this literally. I am six feet tall and wear a size 12. I literally am not like everyone else. And I was born on Christmas. Hello. I am unique. So individually, you are unique as a leader. And your organization is unique in the impact and how you do what you do. So what makes you unique? What makes your organization unique? You have to know that. And I'm pausing intentionally so you can write that down. And if you have to think long, you're thinking wrong. And what do I mean by that? It's not guesswork. The first thought that comes to your mind of what makes us unique is your answer. The second thought is you talking yourself out of it. If you are the only one, if you are the history making, if you are the, the organization that has revived or rebirth, you're challenging, you're disrupting, what makes you unique? Overcup Initiative is the only collective group support for nonprofit, I'm sorry, for Black women entrepreneurs in the state of Arkansas. There are other efforts, there are other projects and programs within organizations that target this group, but they're not organized, structured, or have a specific outreach purpose to see Black women elevate like over a cup. I know that. What do you know about your organization? Okay, so here is what I know about nonprofit organizations and you as a nonprofit leader. That you're happy about the work that you do. It brings you joy. That really and truly, all of you are, all of you have such a skill set that you, that you can go in the private sector and make way more money because you are the leaders and the movers and the change agents of your community. So you don't have a deficit in skill set. You don't have a defi deficit in busy savageness. You don't have a deficit in leadership and collecting and galvanizing and taking the risk. You're nonprofit leaders. You're challenging problems and being a solution bearer every day. But here's what I also know, that you're frustrated and that you are tired of telling one story about what you do and how you do it. And then when you are struggling to survive, financially that is one thing to from nine to five to know that you're making an impact and then to email a consultant or to email a fellow peer and say I'm drowning and maybe that is not you but I believe that some of you are here because you do actually have what it takes and I know that all of you are here, excuse me, you have what it takes. But here is what separates great fundraisers and nonprofit organizations that excel. They have the confidence. And they know what they need and they know how to share it and put it in a story that captures the heart of the audience. When you are sharing your story, you have to know to whom you are speaking. Not everyone is moved in the same way. If you are sharing your story to children, 
They don't care anything about the facts. <laughs> you have to make it relatable. If you are sharing it to seasoned individuals, seasoned in age, they want to ensure that their legacy will matter in the work that you're doing. If you are sharing to sharing it to millennials and the generation X, Y, Z, one, two, three, that's starting over, <laughs> our children, they are linking their money to impact. They're in the movement on their own that they want to know that they are making a difference and changing the world. So how your story matters. Did you ever grow up with a saying, it's not how you say things. I mean, what you say is how you say it. It's the same aspect in storytelling as well. So as we are going through, and I want to make sure that I'm holding your attention, if this is sounding good to you, you're in agreement, would you put in the chat one? Just want to make sure that you're still here with me as well. And I want to make sure now that you have a pen and paper as we dive into the good stuff. Okay, I feel like it's already been good, but you know, again, I'm not average, so I'm highly conceited in some areas. <laughs> but seriously, thank you. Okay, so your ask, getting off your ask usually centers around these key areas. And we're going to dive deeper into this even next week in part two of this conversation and in the relaunch of the Executive Leader Circle, the nonprofit coaching program that you hear more about on next week. But in these areas are usually where nonprofit organizations um, are experiencing some troubles. You either have an ask in your support, you need more staff, you need interns, you need better support and participation, um, even for board members to just show up to the meetings. <laughs> Two, you have an ask with your structure. You need better ways to get things done. You are working on a thousand programs, you know that you are making an impact. People are tagging you and posting you, resharing, and you have a lot of social influence and you can do a lot of things. And then the community brings you things because you have made a name for yourself. But on the inside of your operations, you're like, what are we doing? We need to be structured better. Or you have an ask in which everyone gets to this point in your sales, which for nonprofit leaders that equate to fundraising and income. Now, I also believe that nonprofits should integrate business principles into their organizations. And then plus, I was just trying to go with the SSS. But, <laughs> but sales, your income. You may have a million dollar worth of ideas and you feel like you're doing a million dollar worth of work, million dollars worth of work, excuse me but you're doing that on a shoestring budget. And you're smiling along the way because you don't want to exemplify to the community that you actually need money to make impact. As if going to paying your light bill in your lease space operates on love. If any one of you have ever submitted a note to the people that you owe the cell phone bill that you pay that say, hey, I'm a nonprofit leader and it has worked and you have not had to pay anything, will you please let me know because you are the secret sauce. But even as a nonprofit leader, you still have bills to pay. So you may even be new to the nonprofit space. Um. And uh, you feel like, well, can I ask, how does my story even starting out will help galvanize the income that I need? And then you also may be in the space to where you don't ask or you want to ask more. There are so many um, aspects. There's even, let me share this with you. There's different type of leaders in nonprofit organizations. Complacency though will counsel results. Because there are some organizations, and even you on here probably, that, are may, that may be successful fundraisers, 
that you set a fundraiser, you meet your goal, you meet your mark, you can do capital campaigns, you will always meet your goal because you're in the right circles, you have the right social connections. You have a mission and that you can and and that people believe in your mission. But here's what I also see on the other side of getting off your ask is that sometimes we can fundraise and have more mission, have more money, excuse me, than we have mission. That we're doing the work to fundraise well, but programs are subpar. Because we are meeting the goals and the demands of getting off our ask to fundraise and ask for the money. But you probably are not satisfied with the impact that you are making. All of us have a need. Everyone always has a need from the seasoned CEO, the established nonprofit entity, to the novice leader, the early founder. Everyone has a need. The place that you're at right now in your life, you have a need. The place that you are at in your leadership with your nonprofit organization, you have a need. The question is, what am I burying? What need do I have that I am afraid to ask for? And then how do I share that in a compelling way? that people would want to support the work that I do, the work that I'm starting, the work that I'm continuing, the work that I'm building, the work that we need to address the problem that we have in our community. How do I share this story well? Everyone has a need. If you can agree to that, that all of us have a need, and no matter what place we are at in life, will you place a two in the chat? All righty. So let's dive in. Here's what I also know. I often say this statement, we can complicate kindness, that it doesn't take a lot to be kind to someone, a smile, a hug. It doesn't take a lot. I also know that we can complicate support. Again, going back to the biblical principle, I believe that we have not because we ask not. I also believe, again, that we have not because we ask amiss, that we do not know how to share our story. When I was sharing with you about the opening and why Overcup was founded, what did that do to you to hear the number $24,000? What did that do to you when you heard that it's not the divide of race, it's not the divide of culture, it's not actually the, the surface divide that is hindering economic success for African Americans and other groups of minority status in this nation, that it's really access to information. What did it do for you? Because it stirred up some emotion. That is how we share our story. You have to evoke an emotion that leads to a response. Now, I didn't land in my ask because that was part two. That is will be part two of what do I want you to do with that information. But the first part of sharing your story is to know the data point at which you are operating. You should know about your population that you're serving. You should know the environment in which you are serving. You should know numbers that can be researched and supported. That this was from a study that I even participated in myself that is backed up by American Express that is backed up by the Department of Labor, that is backed up by the Small Business Administration. What do you know that you can find from the census, from other research banks and institutions? You should know a compelling data point about your organization. 
So with that, these are the questions that I need for you to ask yourself right now and to make a note of it. Because when you put all of this together, your why, this is a part of your story that you should always rehearse as well. If you've heard me speak about overcup, then you automatically know that data point. It's probably time for me to up that data point. But right now, it's still evoking emotion. So I'll use it. So what data point do you know about the community to which you serve and the people that you are helping? What do you know that will make someone else say, wow, oh, are you serious? You should know that. Number two, what do I need? A part of your story is knowing what you need. You actually don't need 10 people right now on your staff. I know, you're probably thinking like, what are you talking about? Mm -mm. If you can walk into, into Chick-fil-A right now and they're operating with 12 people and they're serving thousands and thousands of people a day, you're not doing the same impact in this moment of consistency, of the own service demand, unless you are the nonprofit that has a 24 seven approach or 16 hour approach in direct help. I know I'm probably limiting some dreams right now, but we have to put this in context of the service demand and program demand. What do you need? Do you need for people to donate to you so that you can open a 24 hour housing facility for women in abusive situations? What do you need? that you are already working on, but this is the next level. Ha, ah, that's the point. Not the wish list. What are you doing right now that gets you to the next level that you cannot do on your own? Because this is what we need to share in our story. I need people to support Over a Cup initiative and to support Black women entrepreneurs by patronizing them, yes, every day, but also in advocating and helping to disrupt systems that were specifically designed to get people out of the know of the information and the access. Every day I'm learning something about tax laws while we're getting mad at millionaires for not paying taxes. Do you know as a business owner, that's actually the road that I should be on? But what is the hindrance, the access to the information? So I need people in those spaces that can help support, that can help bring awareness, that can get get me in spaces and into rooms and the and the women into spaces and to the in into rooms and to share what if these barriers were broken do you know when arkansas specifically is one of the poorest nations in the state just what if when we give access and we give opportunity to all how this rising tide can lift all ships that we can go from 47 and we can get to number one or two. That should be the collective goal of our state. For us to get below leading in the worst areas of social impact indicators. Two, when you're telling your story, why do you need it? Why do you need people to donate to your organization? Why do they need to partner with you to evoke this change? What makes your organization unique? Because there are many organizations. Why do they need to choose you? 
And remember, when you think long, you think wrong. That first answer, you may think, oh, that's a little conceited. No, that's the right answer. It's the right way to think. Because if you do not believe in what you do, it is going to be hard to convince others. People will say, fake it until you make it. I actually have said that before, and I regret saying that. Because you hear it so much, there is a buy-in. Why do we need to fake it till we make it? How about we be it? And then we're becoming more. Everyone is great. At the level that you are now with your organization, you are great. Be in that moment. We don't have to fake anything. Remember, the word of God tells us it's the truth that sets us free. So why would we fake it? Fakeness is a lie. Why would we do that? Here's the next thing. As we're telling our story, remember, we also have to think about the giver. What value do they receive when you communicate your ask? When you get off your ass, what value, what's the partnership in it for them? Remember, as nonprofit organizations, people don't have to do anything for you because you have a 501c3 tax exempt status. People don't have to give to you. It's just like there's a thousand clothing brands. Are you loyal to all of them? No. You have aligned yourself with the entity that provides the most value to you in the current space that you are in. It's the same way when people want to give and to partner with your organization. They must receive a value and telling your story will help them determine the values they receive. Your story must evoke emotion. It must evoke some type of emotion. And remember, we're integrating this with some data point. You should be the expert of your impact. You should know if you are participating, um, your organization is leading the charge, let me say that, um, in literacy campaigning. You should know the data points of reading literacy of your population, of your population, excuse me. You should know it like the back of your hand. No one. Now, there may be a lot of experts in the room. Let me preface this with an asterisk, right? <laughs> but I guarantee you as well, I will be able to participate in the conversation when it comes down to nonprofit entities, when it comes down to philanthropy, when it comes to Black women entrepreneurship in this state, because I do my homework. I walked in, in a, I walk in a room armed and ready for discussion. Because on the side of what I'm doing, I commit myself daily to researching about the work that I do, the business that I am building and leading, and the impact that I desire to make for great nonprofit leaders like yourselves. So I, I will do everything in my power to know my stuff. You should know about your work. You should be the leading conversationalist the the one of the top um, go-to individuals or your organization should be one of the go-to entities when it comes down to the mission that you are in. They should speak your name. So know your stuff. Going back to your story must evoke emotion. And here are the four points that we're going to cover. And then We'll cover more on in part two of next week. So let me give you these quickly. Your story should evoke an emotion of empathy, putting people into spaces that they are not normally in. That as you tell your story there to, to an audience, that sometimes you'll be telling it to evoke empathy. Like, wow, that could have been me. That could have been my daughter. One of my clients specializes in human trafficking. And one of the things we often share, and you know, I'm often sharing with her about evoking the emotion. Because unfortunately, the vulnerability of women 
that it could be us or our daughters or our kin. And we are thankful for um, the protection of God over our lives. But unfortunately, right now, there are young women being abducted as we speak. This is why these organizations matter, right? If you're listening to that, that evoked that emotion of empathy. If you agree, put a three in the chat. That like, wow, that could be me or my seed or my nieces and or my nieces or that could, it evokes that emotion. Number two, sometimes you'll tell your story to evoke anger. Like we can't let this happen again. That we can't let teenage boys walk into neighborhoods unsafely and that they have a possibility because of how they look or the skin that they're in to be gunned down by vigilantes who are operating in the name of neighborhood vengeance and are able to take a life without cause. Because I am a mother of a black boy, Trayvon Martin. There are some stories that we tell in the organization that was started because of their hurt and their anger. That we cannot let this happen again, not on my watch. Right? There's a story if you tell your as you're telling for more. That there should be more of organizations. There's an organization on here, but there should be more organizations that are advocating for families and young mothers who may not know what to do in the moment of decision, a temporary decision of sexual intimacy now has a primary decision of birthing a life, but they're not ready and we value life. And so therefore there's organizations that are here to say there should be more helping those mothers on the ground and say, you know what, but your baby can have a life with other families who can't possibly have children physically. Oh, but they'll love them as they're on. And that you can live your life knowing that you make the best decision for your child and your child could be happy. That that should be more organizations like this. And then the last emotion is the emotion, right, of justice. That you don't want things to take place in your community that isn't right. That you have a moral compass. That you don't want to see innocent men and women falsely imprisoned. Because, uh, because unfortunately, the poor that you are in this community and this nation, you have a likely high, likelihood, higher likelihood, excuse me, of being falsely in prison just because you don't have the money. So this emotion evokes that it's not right, that there's an emotion of justice. Like, like the Equal Justice Initiative that have exonerated people that have been in prison 20, 30, 40 years for crimes that they did not commit. Now, there are some more that we can possibly get into, but usually these are the leading emotions of storytelling. Here's the last question that I have as we wrap this up. Where does your story fall in these emotions right now? The emotion of empathy? Do you have a story that can anger people when they hear it, but makes them want to actually be solutions to solving it? Do you have the story of more? There should be more like this. There should be more work being done. Or do you have this causal for justice that there is the things are not right, that are damaging, and that have been here, and they take they may take a long time to accomplish, but justice has to prevail. 
Where do you fall? Because you have to know the audience. You have to know who you're speaking to, but you have to know how to deliver. So as you are working on that ahead of next week, I want you to think about that and reflect over what we've shared today and know that your story is profitable. Your story is profitable and you have a great story to tell and people are awaiting to hear it. But just like anything, you have to know what you know. You have to put it together because it helps you. You have to practice it. I even look in the mirror. Even as I am delivering unto you today, I, you know, you have to be mindful of your mannerisms and the how you deliver, how you smile. You may say, this is work. It is. Nonprofit does not mean a void of labor. <laughs> there is work to be done internally, but for more importantly, the external impact that you all will make. By just tweaking these little things right now, this is a part of the work. This is the part of your training. This is how we better ourselves for better outcomes. You're right, it is not for the faint in heart, but you can do it because you're called to it. Not everyone can lead in this space. Not everyone can do this work. And unfortunately, in this line of work, we will hear more, more no's than we do yeses. But guess what? All we need is one yes. And then we look for the next yes. And then we take the critique of the nose, and then we go on to look for more yeses. Trust me, I know this all too well. As a consultant <laughs> that's trying to work with nonprofits, I hear more no's. <laughs> if I don't give it away, <laughs> I know this work. It's not for the faint at heart. But I believe in the value of what I offer because I believe in the who that I serve. I serve you and I believe in the work that you do. So I get up to fight another day. I do hope that today's workshop helped you. I do hope that you will spread the word and share with your board members and your staff um, and your team members. You cannot do this work alone. If you are here as a leader and are the only person here and have to be responsible for regurgitating this information back to your people, which I do advise, maybe in a short training, this replay will be available as well. But it's easier to say, hey, y'all, we have mandatory training next Tuesday at 9 a.m. And we're going to all get trained together because you can't be responsible for the knowledge intake as well as responsible for the output of your staff. It's too much for you to do. Don't, don't do that. So, hey, say, hey, let's solve it. Everyone is here. <laughs> and then we'll have a debriefing after. Your board members, if they want to help you lead well, they need to consume the information that you consume. You grow better when you grow together. All right, thank you all so much for joining me and I will see you all next time.